I landed a job placement for my college program after my third year. I was in a forestry program, and I landed a position with a logging company that operated out of a small town in Washington State. I managed to find a basement apartment under a house that was in the main part of town. My landlord Adam was single, probably in his late thirties. He was a quiet guy, much like me. When I first moved in, he invited me up to his place for dinner. He had his mom over too. It was kind of awkward, but they seemed like really good people, so I felt comfortable there. Being a co-op placement, it was more about the experience than the paycheck. That's what I told myself anyway, because the pay was very low. I was far away from friends and family, and barely making any money, so it's good that the area was so beautiful. We were in the mountains, and I got to work outside almost every day. The nature of the job meant that I didn't get to meet many other people, other than the few that I worked with. Being in my early 20s, it was rare that I would talk to anybody who was not at least 10 years older than me. The town was small, and opportunities to socialize were limited, so I spent a lot of time at home. This went on for the first month, and by then, I still hadn't made a single friend. My landlord must have noticed this, so one day when we were passing in front of the house, he invited me out. There wasn't much in the town, but it did have a few pubs. I hadn't been to any of them yet. When Saturday night came, Adam sent me a text after dinner, and we met out front to check out the bar. He told me that we were meeting some of his friends there. I felt like a bit of a charity case being brought out like that, but it beat another lonely night in the basement. The bar was a short walk, and we got there as the sun was still up. When we went inside, it had a wood panel interior and an old style jukebox. The locals seemed to all know each other, and I felt like everyone was looking at me as we made our way to a table. Whether they actually were, I'm not sure. People are always paying attention to us less than we think. The place was busy, but not packed. We had no problem getting a table, but there were at least 20 or 25 people there. They were mostly older, but there was this one guy who couldn't have been much older than me, early 20s tops. He stood out, not because he was particularly interesting, but because he was clearly drunk and not handling it well. He was sitting at the bar, almost falling over, and it looked like he was all by himself. I looked over a few times when we first got in, and it seemed like nobody was with him. He was loud, slurring his words, and he was following over everyone around him. It was clear that he was annoying everyone. I saw people looking and trying to move away from him, but he seemed unaware that he was making a fool of himself. Adam caught me watching, then leaned in and said, Best not to get involved. Let him be. That was fair advice, but I couldn't understand why the bartender was still serving him. This went on for hours, and at around 11pm, the bartender escorted the young man out of the bar. The drunk guy stumbled out the door, barely able to keep himself upright. We watched through the window as he disappeared down the street, then we turned back to our drinks. I asked Adam if he was going to be okay. He said, I don't know, and shrugged, but that was the last time we discussed it. The bar closed at midnight, so it wasn't long before we took off as well. I was a little drunk by the end of the night, and I imagine Adam was too. We walked back to the house, and then went to bed. One day the next week when I was coming home from work, Adam was sitting on the porch smoking a cigarette. That was strange, because I had never seen him smoking before. When I was walking down to the side entrance, he called me over. I walked up to the porch, and he offered me a cigarette. I turned it down, but I took a seat next to him. It's when he told me something that I'll never forget. He heard from someone in town that a body had been found in the river, about a mile outside of town. It was the drunk guy from the bar. He had drowned apparently fallen into the river in his drunken state, and the news sent a chill down my spine. The mood in town shifted after that. Some said he was messing around and fell into the river. Others suggested that foul play might have been involved, though there was no evidence to suggest anything of the sort. The truth is that no one really knew what happened after he was kicked out of the bar. I think the most likely thing is that he was wasted and fell into the river. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. I still can't understand why nobody made sure he got home safe. Usually the bar is responsible for making sure drunk customers at least get into a cab. Since this was such a small town though, everything was walking distance, so maybe the rules are different. It still seems messed up to me though. I still had another two months in that town, and for the rest of my time there, I kept my head down and focused on work. I never went out again, because I was put off by how that young man was treated. I'm not aware of any consequences for the bar staff, but I think they should feel bad.
My name is Andrew, or as my friends and family call me as a nickname, Annie. I live in a small southern Colorado town. Let's just say that my town is pretty much known for the devil's lettuce. Anyway, back in the ancient days known as the 2000s, I had a good friend named Anthony. The two of us knew each other since we were probably six or seven years old, and we bonded due to the fact that we were both Dragon Ball Z fans, wrestling fans, video game lovers, and kind of outsiders. We weren't weird or anything like that. We just didn't really fit in with the small town jocks or holier than thous that we were surrounded by. I was mostly being raised by my grandparents and dad, while he was being raised by his aunt and uncle. Neither of us had a traditional family life. Like I said, it's a small town, and those you associate with, rightly or wrongly, you almost had a prejudgmental opinion of them, and vice versa. We used to get laughed at for wearing Dragon Ball Z t-shirts to school, so that more or less tells you how we grew so close. I lived in a cul-de-sac that was more or less situated in the center of town, though we were up a small hill. It's hard to describe if you'd never been there before, but it gives us a really good view of the rest of town. Anthony used to come over on the weekends and during the summer vacation, and we would just do normal kids things. We'd play wrestle on the trampoline, climb the large hill behind my house, skateboard, play video games, and watch Dragon Ball Z. Nothing too strange ever happened until one evening during the summer when we saw something that changed our lives. It was probably around late June, so the days were long and warm. We were outside just talking. It was probably about what girl we thought was cute, or if we thought our favorite wrestler was going to win the championship belt. Then we saw what I can only describe as a crucifixion of someone our age. At least that's the only real way I can describe it. Where my house was, we had a good view of another hill that was probably a hundred or so yards away. That area was kind of on its own. There was a small private school over there, a small grocery store, a small church, basically all the things a really small town had. No one from town, myself included, ever interacted or really knew anyone over there though. We were always told to more or less mind our own business when it came to those people, but this really changed things for me. Like I said, me and Anthony were outside and we heard screaming. It was coming from someone our age, at least that's what it sounded like. We looked over and on a makeshift cross, we saw someone that looked around our age, tied to it, being hit with two large whips by two adults. We were shocked. We both looked at each other and said, Do you fucking see that? Neither of us knew what to think, or even what to do. We watched for a few seconds, and trust me, those seconds felt like an eternity. The cries and screams grew more and more with each whip. The whips were so loud, we could hear every crack on the poor kid's skin. It was absolutely horrid, and I wanted to puke. We rushed in and told my grandpa, who I lived with. He told us just to mind our own business. How the hell can we mind our own business with something like that going on? It was grotesque. My grandpa assured us that the person was only tied to the cross and would be let down after their punishment. He had so many questions. My grandpa went on to explain that there were some really strange people who lived over there, and they followed a sub-branch of the Catholic Church that basically bordered more along a cult than it did a traditional religion. It would be some years later that I learned they were too radical for the Catholic Church and were basically banned and condemned from being associated with it. My grandma told us that she knew a few people associated with that religion, and they were strange. So much so that the authorities didn't interfere with anything over there, and that the whole punishment by faux crucifixion had become normalized. Onlookers just learned to leave it be, because again, the authorities in these small towns didn't really care much anyway. My grandpa told us to go into the other room and play video games, and try to forget what we just witnessed. Safe to say, seeing something like that at our age, nothing was going to push those images from our mind. We went into the room and started playing Pokemon Stadium on my Nintendo 64. Anthony, being the daredevil that he was, suggested that we plan a trip up there one of these nights, just to check things out and see how weird those people really were. I didn't want to do it. But Anthony had a way of convincing me, since we were usually pretty bored most of the time anyway. So I reluctantly agreed, thinking, or should I say hoping, that it was just talk and we would never actually follow up. A couple days later, me and Anthony got together again, and we were just walking around and talking, not really fearful that anything bad could happen. At around 8, he suggested that we go up that hill and have a look for ourselves. I didn't really want to, but I agreed anyway. You know, being young and all, it sounded interesting, or at the very least a cure for the small town boredom. 
Anthony asked his uncle and aunt if he could stay over at my place, and they agreed. My grandparents went to bed at around 9 or 10 every night, so we waited until they were asleep before we set off. It was probably around 10.30pm when we left my house, and we made sure we were extra quiet. We packed up a couple of backpacks with water bottles and small snacks. Of course we had flashlights too, we didn't know exactly how long we'd be gone for. It took us about 20 minutes to get to the area. We didn't see anyone on our way, nor did we see any vehicles, just the faint sound of dogs barking in the distance. By the time we got there, all we saw was a small school, a small building that I believe was their grocery store, and another church-like building. That's where the makeshift cross stood outside, in what I assume was the back courtyard area of the church. It must have been the one that you could see from my house, where they had that kid tied up, I thought. Anthony said we should check it out. We both had flashlights, and we shined them around the area. To our horror, we saw what must have been at least 30 or so gravestones. I can't lie, at that age, seeing that in the darkness of the night made us both jump. But again, we were both young and male, so we wanted to be as brave as possible. There was a large thick tree there, and Anthony had a small pocket knife. He suggested that we carve our first initial in to say we were there. I went along with it. It took us a little longer than anticipated but we both carved two pretty jacked up looking A's into the tree trunk. There was a small door on the side of the building that had a lit candle right next to it. To our surprise, the door was open just slightly. Anthony pushed it and it was completely open. He whispered to me that we should go inside and look around. We stepped in quietly and shined our flashlights. I gotta be honest, I was expecting someone to be in there. Why else would the door be open at a church like this in the middle of the night? But on further inspection, there was no one in there. It was completely vacant, which honestly added to the creepiness level of everything. We went in further, and amongst the rows of seats, it was strange, but we didn't see anything that reminded us of a traditional church, at least in imagery. As someone of Hispanic and Sicilian descent, I had been to a Catholic church before, and this was completely different. The only thing that stood out was that there was a large cross hung from the ceiling that looks like it could collapse at any minute. It was a bit unnerving, to say the least. The place had a weird smell, like a combination of wet, rotting wood and something metallic, like dried blood. Again, hard to describe, it was just weird. There was a stained glass window, which was the closest thing to a traditional Catholic church, but the people painted on it weren't anything like the religious figures that you'd recognize from a Catholic church. The people painted on these stained glass windows were dressed differently, dare I say more cultish. We searched the place for a few minutes, until I heard Anthony call out, Annie, come here, hurry, you gotta see this. So I walked over, and there was a huge box full of what appeared to be VHS tapes, all with tape markings on them. Some had red X's, and some had blue circles, they had nothing else on them. I asked Anthony what he thought they were, and he honestly had no idea, nor did I. I guess our naive youthful minds worked in our favor in that regard, because who the hell really knew? We pondered taking one back and watching it, but then we heard what sounded like a car pulling up outside, despite not seeing any headlights. We both turned off our flashlights and hid in the altar area. Sure enough, we heard a car door close. Anthony suggested it might be a cop, and I was honestly hoping to hell that it was. It was at that moment that Anthony said, Fuck it, let's go. Then we ran out the door that we entered through, jumping the fence in the back courtyard near those gravestones. It was at that point that we heard a husky, deep male voice yell out, Get your asses back here. Goosebumps filled my entire body as I felt my heart in my throat. I wanted to be sick, but the adrenaline kept me and Anthony moving. I don't think we ever ran so fast in our lives. It took us about ten minutes or so of pure running to get back to my house. I never looked back the entire time, nor did Anthony. Once we got there, we went into my grandpa's carport to catch our breath and collect ourselves. Just processed the entire thing. Who the hell was that? Anthony asked. I don't have a clue, I answered. We were both swearing like sailors, in a way to make ourselves sound older and tougher than we actually were. We both looked around for any signs of vehicles that might have followed us, but luckily we never saw anything, or anyone. At this point, my grandma turned on the porch light and called out to me. Annie, are you boys out there? I replied, yeah. We're just out here riding on our skateboards. She told me it was too late for that and for us to get inside, which of course we didn't object to. We left our backpacks outside until morning. 
Oddly enough, I couldn't shake the weird smell of that place. It almost attached itself to our clothes. Musty, dirty water, something metallic-like. Just so strange and hard to explain. Neither of us slept much that night. We stayed in my room awake just talking about what we had seen, both trying to figure it out. What was on those tapes? Who was that person who showed up seemingly with no lights on their vehicle? And why would they have had their lights off considering the time of night? Did they actually know beforehand that we were there? Why was the door open with the candle on? Why was the smell so weird? It was honestly like we just stumbled into some weird horror movie. The next morning, my grandma woke us both up to eat breakfast. My grandparents used to eat breakfast out on the deck during the summer months. Me and Anthony ate ours down in the carport. We once again tried to figure out what the hell we had seen the night before, but instead, we began to laugh. It was a combination of the unknown and boys being boys, trying to act tougher than we actually were. As the years went by, a lot of those people who were apparently part of that cult or religion passed away or moved on. It really isn't a thing around here anymore. In fact, I heard that a lot of the people who lived in that area have since relocated to New Mexico. The church that we went into has been closed down, and there's a small butcher shop there. Weirdly though, all those gravestones are still there. It was an experience I'll never forget, and something that me and Anthony talked about for many years after. Unfortunately, Anthony passed away a few years ago. He was dealing with another type of demons that he struggled with due to various traumas that he faced in his life. I miss my friend every day, and this is an experience I'll take to my own grave with me. I miss you, man. I'll see you on the other side. I thought our experience was one worth sharing. I went to visit my parents about a year and a half ago. I live in a big city, but my parents moved to a small town about 10 years before this story took place. This was not where I grew up though. They moved there after my sister and I went to college. Part of the reason that they moved was so that they could downsize to a place that was more appropriate for two rather than four. They had a two bedroom condo in a gated community that was pretty nice. Even though there was a guest room at their place, I would usually stay at a hotel because I like to have my own space. I also brought my laptop and thought I might be able to get some work done after my parents went to bed. Their town was about 8 hours away, so it made more sense for me to drive than fly. I left in the morning, and it was late afternoon by the time I reached the hotel. The place where I normally stayed was full, so I had to stay at my second choice. It was more of a motel-style place with rooms on the ground floor than the parking lot in the middle. That being said, it was alright and it looked clean. I parked in front of the office and then went in to get my key. I had made a reservation and paid in advance, so it was quick. There were a few cars in the parking lot, including a white van parked right in front of my room. It seemed out of place, but I went and parked next to it in order to be close to my room. As I unloaded my bags, I noticed a man in the driver's seat of the van. He was staring at his phone, not even glancing up as I passed by. I dismissed him as perhaps waiting for someone or taking a break. It could have been a work van for all I knew. Inside, the room was exactly what I was expecting for the price. Clean but dated, just a standard room. After taking a quick shower, I went to have dinner with my parents. Time passed quickly, and before I knew it, it was close to 11pm. That was past the time when my parents would normally go to bed, so I left and went back to the hotel. The parking lot was quieter than before, but the van was still there. As I passed it, I looked into the front window. It was empty, so I figured the guy just had the room next to me and had gone to bed. It seemed that there wasn't much more to it than that. I went in and took a shower, and I brushed my teeth and laid on my bed. I opened my laptop ready to watch something, but eventually I closed it and put it on the bedside table. Then I closed my eyes and tried to get some sleep. That was when I heard a noise. It was like a creak in the walls, subtle, but enough to startle me. It could have been from one of the neighboring rooms, but I couldn't help feeling paranoid. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to check the room, if only to ease my mind and assure myself that it was nothing. I got up and turned on the lights, and walked around and looked under the bed. Then I went to the bathroom and looked around. I was feeling silly for even considering that there was someone there, especially because a lot of these hotels have thin walls. That sound seemed very close when I heard it, so I couldn't help but feel curious. Before going back to bed, I decided to check the closet. I hadn't even opened it yet since I'd been there, but when I slid the door open, I saw what looked like a dead body lying on the floor. 
I looked at it for a few seconds thinking it was fake. It was lying face down and I could see a messy head of hair with a hood from a blue sweatshirt covering part of it. I started breathing heavily and turned and left through the door. I ran up to the front desk out of breath and shaking. The night clerk, a young guy probably in his early 20s, looked up, startled by my sudden appearance. I managed to stammer out what happened, and he immediately called the police. Not more than 30 seconds later, I glanced outside towards my room. Its headlights flickered on, and the engine started, then it drove out of the parking lot. It seemed strange to me, that I still didn't know what was going on. The police arrived, and when they checked my room, the body was gone. When I heard that, I realized that it was the man in the van. Couldn't have been anything else. It turned out that the van belonged to one of the other rooms, but it was already gone. With only my word, there wasn't much the cops could do, and they left. He might have been a thief, hiding until I slept so he could rob me, or worse, but nothing was missing, not even my laptop which was right in plain sight. I didn't sleep that night, nor did I stay at that motel any longer. I went to my parents' house instead. When I told my mom what happened, she could hardly believe it. Their town was not known for crime, so I think the man was from outside their town, because neither of my parents had ever seen a van that matched that description. What his real intentions were, I don't know, but he scared the crap out of me for sure. I honestly thought I saw a dead body that night. I was living in Salt Lake City, Utah at the time when this happened, and I was heading to Las Vegas. I was meeting some of my friends from college, and they were all flying in from different locations around the country. Even though it was just a five or six hour drive, I knew that it would be lonely in the desert, and I was right. I had an old Honda Civic that had been with me for over ten years. I had made this drive a few times before, so I thought it would be fine, but when I was in the middle of the desert, my car broke down. I knew the engine was hot, and eventually something blew. Steam poured from the front of my car and I steered over to the side of the road while I still had the momentum to do so. I should mention that I was 30 years old when this happened, and it was 1998, so I didn't have a cell phone, not that there would probably be service there anyway. According to my map, there was a small town up ahead about 8 miles away. Not unwalkable, but definitely farther than I wanted to go on foot. I decided to wait for a while, and if I needed to, I would walk for help. It was only 2 in the afternoon, so I had time. After about half an hour, a car pulled over. The vehicle was a beaten up Ford with two people inside. I walked over and thanked them for stopping. The two introduced themselves as Jesse and Alan. They were two guys that looked to be in their 20s, and they let me get into the back seat. As soon as we started driving, it became clear that Jesse and Alan didn't like each other very much, or at least they were not getting along at the time. They were constantly arguing, which made for an awkward ride. I was trying to mind my own business and pretend I didn't notice, but how could I not? The first thing that either of them said to me was when Jesse offered to bring me to their house, which was in the nearest town, the one where I was going to walk to. I was surprised that these two lived together. I can only imagine how awkward dinner would be. Jesse then started talking about their other friend Brutus. They talked about him like he was some kind of a saint and insisted that I meet him. I told them politely that I wanted to get my car taken care of before dark but they wouldn't let it go. Eventually, I agreed to check out their house, knowing that I could simply leave and find help in town. It was only a short drive to the town, and their house was just half a mile away from the service station, which seemed to have a tow truck service. We passed it on the way in. The house they brought me to was as unsettling as their company. It was a dilapidated old house standing alone in the desolate landscape. We got out of the car and went in. I followed the other two. The whole time, I was trying to think of a way to leave without being rude. As soon as I stepped inside, I saw a man standing in the front foyer. He was dressed in a suit, standing there as if he was waiting for us. Remember that none of us had phones, so they couldn't have told him I was coming. Jesse disappeared briefly while Alan introduced me to the man in the suit. He was Brutus, but I'm not sure if that was his real name. Jesse then returned with a tray of drinks. They were just regular coffee cups, but he had them on what looked like a silver platter. The three of them each took one, but I noticed that none of them took a sip. Maybe they were waiting for me, or maybe there was something in those cups that they didn't want to drink. I tried to refuse mine politely, but I could tell they weren't having it. I was still standing near the front door, and nobody was blocking it. I guess they thought that I would have nowhere else to go, 
but I took my opportunity right there and ran outside. I looked back every few seconds as I ran towards the town. The service station was visible in the distance, and I knew I could make it. Eventually, I saw a car coming up from behind. By then, I was among some other houses, but still alone on the street. I managed to hide behind a tree before the vehicle caught up with me. From there, I watched the car prowl the streets, looking for me. Eventually, they gave up, and I made my break for the service station. There was a single guy working there, and luckily, he seemed normal. The worker told me that the tow truck driver was on call that day, and it would be two hours before he could help. As I was waiting in the station, Jesse walked in. He walked straight towards me, looking angry. I thought he was going to try something, but there was the worker in the station, and there were also a few customers there, so he didn't make a move. After he left, the gas station worker's laugh broke the tension. Those guys are crazy, he said. You didn't go into their house, did you? He asked me while laughing. I looked over to him and forced a smile. I got out of there fast, I told him. He laughed again, and then went back to his work. The tow truck driver arrived, and I left the town behind. The driver was able to fix my car on the spot, and I made it to Vegas before dark. My friends thought the story was hilarious when I told them later. Maybe those guys were just a bunch of harmless weirdos, or maybe they were actually dangerous.